I'm going to put you on a plane and we're going to fly about 12, 13 hours away and to a place in the northern, most northern part of Israel, Caesarea Philippi, where uh, Pastor Deke and I were blessed to be a part of this February. We were actually there and uh, we we're hoping everything fine for us to take everybody that wants to go in November there as well. But for you tonight, uh, this is going to be the cheapest trip to Israel you've ever taken. And we're going we're gonna to go north of the Sea of Galilee, uh, right there at the head uh, of the country, where even the head of the water that flows into the Jordan River that runs all the way down to the Sea of Galilee and through the Sea of Galilee, back into the Jordan River, down to the Dead Sea, giving them the life that they have from the water that comes. Uh, so, so, are you ready? This, this flight, there's no social distance, distancing in this flight. You don't have to wear a mask on this flight. Uh, we're not serving any food, though, but you're not really missing anything there. And, uh, but we're going to be going here, and there we are, uh, at Caesarea Philippi. And uh, in the winter before Jesus' death, he actually takes his disciples here, and uh, something very, very transformative happens that I believe uh, educates us and equips us as a church uh, in what we should be doing and how we should be functioning in the world today. It was there he revealed for the very first time that he was the Messiah and, uh, and that he, was, he had come to bring all authority and give it back to uh, this thing he was going to create called the church. And, uh, and, and the, the, there he's standing, and you're st seeing the cave openings there going into uh, the cave where called the gates of hell. So he's actually standing there, he's 1150 feet above sea level, and uh, at the head of where the water's coming out. Earthquakes have kind of uh, rerouted the water flow now. It used to be much more powerful, but it would flow out from here into, like I said, the Jordan River, into the Sea of Galilee, into uh, the Jordan River runs through the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea. Josephus, the historian, said that this was the chief source of water for all of Israel. So they, he said if you drink water from uh, any place in Israel, more than likely it came from this spot here eventually. And, and uh, it was this great revelation that Jesus gave to not only his disciples, but to us. And the Gospels record this and give us this understanding of who we are. And I believe Jesus chose this particular place so that he could make the biggest point possible, make the biggest punch in his point possible, uh, because he's, he had never talked about the church per se until this time. But he said, my plan, I'm going away. I'm the Messiah. I'm coming. I'm, we're going to leave here. I'm going to Jerusalem. Peter's like, you know, later on, Peter gives this revelation of who he is from the Father. But then when Jesus continues to talk about going to Jerusalem, Peter says, you're not going to Jerusalem. They'll kill you. You're not going there. And remember, Jesus had to rebuke him. He said, you know, Satan, get thee behind me. So he's getting a revelation from the Father one minute. And the next minute, he's hearing what the devil's saying. So we've got to be careful. If you, if you operate in the soulish realm, you've got to be very careful what, what voice you're listening to. Uh, you, can be, you can be righteous indignation one moment, and you can be anger, hate, and, and offense the next moment. You've got to be careful. And Jesus, you know, rebuked Peter in that. But it was standing here at the gates of hell. Uh, there's a next slide there that kind of gives you a, a kind of a, a picture of that. Here's Jerusalem down here. Uh, by kind of the tip of the uh, Dead Sea, but to the left here. And, uh, and then you go through Samaria all the way up to the Sea of Galilee. is a little T-shaped uh, lake here. That string that connects it to the Dead Sea is the Jordan River. And then above, north of the Sea of Galilee, is the, north, is the Jordan River north. Going right on up, and you see the arrow pointing into Caesarea Philippi with the mountains above it. Well, this is those mountains, the highest point there in Jerusalem or in Israel. So here's Jesus at the highest point in Israel at a place that had been claimed by all these pagan gods, for these pagan gods. And uh, the Canaanites had uh, claimed it. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans had cl claimed it for their god Pan. Uh, the Canaanites had said for Baal. Uh, it was actually in here that they would take and 
uh, to try and appease Baal, they would cast babies in and against the stone into the water. And if the blood came out of this here and it turned red, it was Baal had rejected their offering. So they had to keep killing babies, keep sacrificing babies until the water switched and they weren't even thinking about the flow. They were just saying if the water, uh, the blood is accepted, then we're going to have fertility. We're going to have our crops are going to be good this year. We're going to have the rain that we need and we're going to have everything, our herds and our, everything's going to be okay. So they were using this, and it had to be innocent blood. That's why they used the babies. So they said they were not old enough yet to sin. So they take babies and these children and kill them there. So it was at this highest place. And what they did there, they said, because of how the water flows north, uh, it will affect the whole country. So Jesus went there to say, what I am establishing is going to affect not only the whole country, but the whole world. And he says, I'm going to establish a church. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to shed my blood. I'm shedding sin, uh, sinless blood. And this sinless blood is going to pay off your sinful account so that you can take your authority back as my church and the gates of hell. And this is called the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's pick up. You know, we've just flown. 13 hours. Thank you for the flight. I pray you can find your luggage afterwards here. But now we are there. And Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, we're picking up. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. Well, he said to them, Who do you say that I am? You know the scripture. You've heard it dozens and dozens of times. And Simon Peter answered and said, Well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, Peter, which he uses a Greek word that means little pebble, uh, Petra, you, you little Petra, little pebble, uh, he says, on this rock, the massive boulder, that word rock means massive boulder, uh, uh, Petros. So he says, upon this Petros, so we know it's the revelation, because he calls Peter, you little, you little chip off of the block. That's what you are, but the block that you just chipped off of is what I'm going to build my church on, and the gates of hell. So he's talking about this place. He's standing right here, saying, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And that he declared standing right there at the moment. There's another slide that kind of gives you what it would have looked like in Jesus' day, uh, right here, uh, where the, the head, the, see, you see the cave that you see now. Well, they had these temples built there for all these gods and so forth and for Baal and for Pan, and uh, so it's looking more like this in Jesus' day rather than just the open uh, a cave there. So this is what he declared, that he was going to build his church and it was going to be a powerhouse. That's the thing that the Lord wanted me to bring to you tonight and remind you that what he has created in us and through us and for us to be a demonstration here on this earth, standing at the highest place that Satan has claimed and saying from the highest place to the lowest place, we take it back. We take it back in the name of Jesus as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he created us to be a powerhouse. Now, we have been challenged recently with powers that we cannot see, that powers that we cannot see, that has affected powers that we cannot understand to make and rule in power, powerful ways in our lives that are affecting us. And when people feel powerless, there's a lot of opportunity for fear to come in. The spirit of fear is just waiting to move in where there's a sense of powerlessness. But we cannot step away from what Jesus has taught us. That Jesus has established in us and through us a powerhouse that the world needs. And this powerhouse is greater than all the power of the enemy. He's actually given us authority over all the power of the enemy. And unless we're reminded by that, by the, the very bumper car experience that we're having in this world today, we will lose sight of who we are and whose we are and what we have and what we are supposed to do. So I'm here to remind 
remind you tonight that we are the power source of God. We are the instruments of righteousness that the Spirit of God has chosen to flow through us uniting together as the church, not as an individual, but as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus says, I'm not going to take a break. I'm not going on a sabbatical. I'm not going to let a pandemic cause me to, to stop. I'm going to build something called the church and the church is going to be the answer to the powerful problem of the gates of hell. And that we must be reminded of who we are. And so in 2 Timothy 3 and 1, Paul reminds us, he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in 2020. You're not supposed to laugh, but at least let me know that you're here with me. There will be terrible times in 2020, in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they will be marked by this. And this is what Paul says. They will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power. They will have this form of godliness, but they had made a decision to deny the power. Now, what does God instruct us to do? Have nothing to do with such people. So I'm here to remind us so that we don't become such people. I'm here to remind myself so that I don't become such person that we as a church, that we've got the power. I'm here to remind you, you've got the power. If you are a child of God, how many of you have claimed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've committed your life to serve him all the days of your life? You are a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has baptized you into the body of Christ and you are a part grafted into the vine of the plan of God and the plan of God was to establish a church that the gates of hell could not prevail against it, a church that did not operate with form only but had power and we must not deny the power. So I want to remind us of a trinity of power. There's much more sources of power that God has given us, but we don't have time tonight, but maybe to look at three. So let us look at a trinity of power, first beginning with the power of the Spirit, the power we have in His Spirit. Because He said His church was about the demonstration, the gospel was about the demonstration of His power. That's what he said. My gospel shall be about the demonstration of power. Power to stand on earth and bind things in the heavenlies and power to stand on earth and loose things in the heavenly. I've given you a picture, and I meant to get it again tonight, but I missed it, uh, of the hand holding the strings, pulling the puppet. And the puppet is being controlled by the hand that is pulling the string. Well, in the heavenlies, we're not talking about God's heaven. We're talking about the mid-heaven where is the very, uh, you might say, resource center of Satan and a command center that he and demons and strategies against the people of God and the plan of God here on earth operate from. These heavenly places that we are to wage war, not against flesh and blood, but these heavenly places that we have the power. God has given us the power that we can stand right where we're at and we can bind what the enemy has planned to move and manipulate and control here on earth. We can cut the string, we can bind it, or that which he has bound, we can cut it and set it free. That God has given us the authority and the power to do this. We got it in Ephesians 6 and 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In these heavenly places. We can stand here on earth. He said, my church has power. I'm building a church that has power. And the power to bind and to lose the things in the heavenly. It's not for uh, some special person passing through to do. It is for you and me. That's what he says in Ephesians 3 and 10. He said, to the intent now, the manifold wisdom of God may be, may be made known, what? By the church to whom? 
the principalities and powers in heavenly places. The earth is waiting. The earth is groaning. The earth is looking for the church to rise up and to exercise our power, to have forth the manifold wisdom of God be made known, the plan of God, the purpose of God to be made known to the principalities in heavenly places. By whom? The church. The church. Let me tell you, if we don't get it, church, and if we don't do it, church, it's not going to get done, church. Do you hear what I'm saying? We have power over the enemy. We have power over sickness and disease. We have power over racism and prejudices and every lying spirit that would try to exert itself. We have power over poverty. We have power over depression. We have power over bondage. I could go on and on. We have power, but we have to exercise that power and not deny it. See, God's design for the church ever since Jesus first mentioned the church and the Bible at Caesarea Philippi was it was to have power, that it would come against the gates of hell. Let me tell you what, I'm not going to be silent and I'm not going to sit by and I'm not going to recline and let the devil just have this world and let the devil just have our country and let the devil just have our family and let the devil just have my mind. No, because I know I'm a part and I'm calling you to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been given power, the power in his spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit through us. Jesus said, be endued on high, uh, be endued, uh, uh, why would he say tarry in Jerusalem until you are what? Endued from on high with what? Power. And that's when the church was birthed. The church was birthed in power. Jesus was foretelling the church's uh, existence that he was going to build. And it would be a power center, a power source. You and I make up the church. So uh, the Lord didn't call the church to be a political entity. He didn't call us to be an economic entity. He didn't call us to be a social entity. He didn't call us to be an entertainment entity. He called the church to be a spiritual entity. Because those spiritual forces that would be working in politics and those spiritual forces that would be working in economics and the spiritual forces that would be working in the social and in the entertainment aspects of life that we would take authority over the influence and the powers of those demonic spirits and we would allow fresh water abundant life to flow from the head all the way down by his holy spirit so we're the church we're god's answer that's god that the only plan god has is the church and the good news is, Jesus, I mean, God's not dumb. He knows that if he's going to choose to establish a church, and the church was going to come against the gates of hell, and the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against it, and the church would ultimately be victorious, then he sees the beginning from the end, and the end from the beginning. So the church wins. Now the thing is, are you going to be a part of the power church, or are you going to be a part of the form church, denying the power? There's a form church that's got it looking like they're the church, but they've denied the power. Let me tell you what. I have tried in my wisdom, and I have tried in my uh, training and understanding, and I have tried with my experiences, and I have tried uh, with the counsel of other men. I have tried my best to come against some of the tide of some of the worst tragedies that have come into society, and I've done it with, with little success. But I'm here to tell you when I step it up and I put on the super, on the natural, when I say, you know what, this was not for me to do because I don't need the glory. And it wasn't for me to figure out because my mind just can't. I've already got the wisdom, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I've already got the power of the Holy Spirit. I've already got the authority. He, what God wants me to do instead of trying to figure it out and recreate a wheel, he wants me to come to him and, and let him flow in and through me to do warfare in the spiritual realm that will affect the natural realm that we live in. We've got to take the fight to where it's most effective. It's what I'm trying to say. Otherwise, we're shadow boxing. That's why Jesus uh, said, John baptized with water, but I baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm going to give you what you need. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Everything Jesus was talking about and teaching about the church was about it being birthed with power. Hallelujah. He has provided all the power and the wisdom that is ever needed. Colossians 2 and 15, Jesus having disarmed principalities and powers. He disarmed them and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So if we're going to triumph, then we've got to be in Christ and do it his way. We can't circumvent his plan. We've got to do it through Christ. 
And I love this making a public spectacle of them is taking a phrase that is used in that day and time where a king would conquer another king. And he would then bring that king with that king's chariot. He would bring that king through the, like a parade, through the city streets. The conquered king being tied and being having to walk behind, humiliated behind the conquering king, and then taken to the end of the parade, and they would chop his thumbs and they would chop his big toes off. And everybody would celebrate that public spectacle. They would celebrate. Why would they celebrate? Because they knew that king would never fight with a sword again because he'd had no thumbs, and he would never run and lead the battle because he didn't have the balance of his big toes. They knew he would never be another threat to them because a king who could not in those days lead in battle was not fit to be a king. So they knew he would never be a king to threaten them again. Well, the Bible says Jesus did that to whom? He disarmed principalities and powers and made a spectacle of them triumphing over them. So what we got to do is st stop being in fear and worried that these things have all the authority on this earth and we need to be in Christ and we need to be filled with the Spirit of God and we need to say, wait a minute, there's already been a public spectacle. Your thumbs have been cut off. Your big toes have been cut off. You can't hold a sword anymore. You can't run in battle anymore. All you can do is lie. All you can do is twist the truth. All you can do is try to get spirit of fear in me. All you can do is get me to lay down my weapons and lay down my authority. But that's not going to happen because there's a pastor, Tim, that's going to keep reminding us over and over and over again of who we are and whose we are and what we have, the Spirit of God. See, the Holy Spirit was not given to us to take us to heaven. The Holy Spirit was not given to us to give us illusions of grandeur. The Holy Spirit was not given to us to give us just goosebumps. Come on now. The Holy Spirit was given to cause life in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. The same Holy Spirit that, that raised Jesus, gave life, that raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in our mortal body to quicken us. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, He is here to energize and mobilize his body on earth. The Holy Spirit is here to enter. You say, well, I just don't feel. The Holy Spirit will, he will jack you up. The Holy Spirit will get your charge from red to green at 100%. All you got to do is pray in the Spirit. All you got to do is yield yourself to the Spirit. All you got to do is start by faith, stepping out to do something in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. To, the Holy Spirit has come to cause the church to arise in power. And to fight back the tide of demonic hordes and principalities and powers on this earth. The only way the devil can have this earth is if the church refuses to do what we were created to do. We weren't created to be pretty. We weren't created to sound all, you know, heavenly. We were not created to even smell good. It's nothing about that. We were created to be a power source that comes against the forces of hell that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. Come on now. So we got to get this proper perspective of this. We tend to be like the disciples on the day that Jesus was ascended. I use this many times because, boy, did it speak to me. Where Jesus tells them that they're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. And there will be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. They're in Acts chapter 1 and 8. And then Jesus ascends and they're standing there gazing into the heavens where Jesus just went up and blessed them. Oh, he blessed them. It's great to get a blessing. I understand. Nothing wrong with a blessing. But they're standing there just gazing. And two angels in white apparel said to them, Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? It was like they were saying, Didn't you just hear what Jesus said? Did you miss it? What did Jesus tell you to do? He didn't say stand here heaven gazing. He said there's a, there's a Jerusalem, a Judea, Samaria, and the whole world that needs the gospel, that needs the power. So you need to get to the upper room and you need to tarry until you've been endued from on high with this power until the day of Pentecost when the God had planned to give the Holy Spirit not for, to be on us but to be in us to flow through us. So get going, the angels were saying. Please hear me. Eternity is going to take care of itself. I know we love heaven and all. Eternity is going to take care of itself, Okay. Now is, is not the time to just sit idly by and write songs about heaven and the sweet by and by. I know it feels good, it sounds good, okay, but we've turned heaven into this gated community of big houses on Golden Street. 
And, and God says the streets are paved with gold. John's been there. He tells us. But you know what? We've got to remember we're not there yet. That is our eternity. That's our future. We've got a, we've got a mission here on earth. We've got a purpose here on earth. Come on now. The Holy Ghost is not for heaven. The Holy Ghost is for you right now while you're still on the ground and still around. Because you need the Holy Ghost power in order to take the stand and to push back the tides of the enemy and advance the kingdom of God. See, the Holy Ghost is not to take us to this gated community with shiny streets in heaven, okay? Now, that, I'm telling you, he wants, the Holy Spirit wants to take us into the highways and the byways where there are those that are bound, where there are those that are hurting, where there are those that are lost, where there are those that, that don't know about the salvation message of Jesus Christ. They don't know the power source of the Holy They don't know. So the, the Holy Spirit's not about taking us to heaven and walking those streets of gold. The Holy Ghost is about taking us into the highways and the byways and compelling them to come in. The, the, the addicted and the broken and, the, and those that are bound and, and those that are poor and those that are hopeless and bring them the message of good news, hallelujah, and the abundant life that Jesus brings. God, God said that every place that the soles of our feet shall tread, he said, I'll give it to you. But I need you to do the walking. I need you to get out there. I've given you authority to tread on serpents, but if you never get up out of your... You know, I, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Get off, off of your sweet by and by. You know, if you don't do that, you're not going to be treading on serpents. Your feet's all reclined up in the air, and the enemy's just exercising his authority when you should be exercising your authority. We've been given power to bring change to this earth. The church, you and I, the battle of the ages is not over heaven. The battle of the ages is not even over hell. The battle of the ages is over what's going on here on earth, which will have an impact on heaven or hell for eternity. But we've we got to get in the game. We've got to get our head in the game. Coaches will tell the, the players when they're, they're, they're under, it's like, wait a minute, you know what to do. You know, how, you know your position. Get your head in the game. But this isn't a game, church. There's a real devil. And if you don't know it by now, he is trying to kill, steal, and destroy. He is trying to kill the whole world, destroy every government, every, every people group of the whole world. He's trying to, he's a liar. Let me tell you why. So, so please don't misunderstand me. I, I believe in heaven and hell, and, and, and it's, but I don't think that's all we should talk about. We need, we need to consider that, that, that God has us here to help people not go to hell and go to heaven, but in the meantime, be a part of the church, join the army of the Lord Jesus Christ in advancing his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? And if we'll do that, let me tell you what, people will find their purpose and destiny and find the greatest joy of living when they find their creative order. Their creative order. We're created to be a part of the church. And I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about the global church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have placed their faith in him. Those who have received the spirit of the living God who want to rise up and want to be used by God to advance his kingdom in a mighty, mighty way. So, so if you're going to live any more years, and I pray each and every one of you do, we need some power. We need some power. We need power to stand, power to endure, power to press on, power to press through the lies, power to stand as light in the midst of darkness. You need some power if you're going to make a difference in the days ahead. And, and I'm telling you, I've come to tell uh, the principalities and the powers that there is a generation of people who are saying enough is enough. The earth is the Lord's. The earth doesn't belong to the devil. I believe there's, you're, you're that generation. It says, wait a minute. The earth doesn't belong to the devil. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's what the word of God says. And that the glory of the Lord shall cover this earth as the waters cover the sea. And we, the church, have received power that we don't just sit by and watch our generation be overthrown. No, we stand up in Holy Ghost power and we, we take back this generation. We have Holy Ghost power. Oh, if I could scream it so loud that it would shake our, our inner core of our being to ever be changed. If I could get a frequency that would re 
reconstruct our mind. I would, I would. But faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So I'm giving you the Word of God. I'm talking about Holy Ghost power. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, trying to be fancy and trying to be all in control. I'm talking about what we need. We're in a war, church. We're in a war. And we need Holy Ghost power. We need power that's bigger than performance. We need power that's bigger than style or talent or doctrine or denomination or cultural heritage or preference. We need power that's bigger than any of that. A church without power cannot operate in a highly charged spiritual environment and, 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 and make a difference for advancing the kingdom of God in this day. It just cannot do it. It cannot do it. We live in a day and an age that is saturated with every unclean spirit. They stood there at the gates of hell in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus had them stand there for him to make the declaration that he was going to build something more powerful, more powerful than all the unclean spirits that they worshipped in that day. Let me tell you what, our, our day and age is saturated, flowing from the media, uh, you might say the media uh, fountain into every Spring, a stream and every, uh, you might would say, tributary and every river and trying to affect and infect every person. The enemy has found a way, as he did then, he's found a way now to try and get into every home and every person. Let me tell you what, there are all kinds of unclean spirits. The spirit of the age, their spirit of sorcery, their spirit of divination. The church people are embracing divination. They're embracing lust. They're embracing rebellion. Because when you don't operate in true power, you start looking for something else. You start looking for something else. And here you have the source of the greatest power from God himself. Not only from God, but it is God himself in us. But because we deny that, we're going and we're looking for every divination and every, I could go list some stuff right now. Oh, my goodness. That it's just, you see church folks, it's just like used to where they would have hide to do it. There was a time they would say no and they would shun it. Then there was a time they would do it but hide it. But today they celebrate it. They just poster child it. It's like it's nothing. And they're almost like saying the church failed me. I didn't get it in the church, so I'm going to find it somewhere else. Well, I'm saying this, the church in some part I know has failed all of us as we have failed others. We are the church. But I'm here to tell you if the church won't hear the truth and embrace the truth and act on the truth, they'll still walk under the influence of deceiving spirits. They're going to find themselves walking away from God and walking away from the plan that God has for your life. And Satan will love that. But I'm here to say we don't have to do that. I don't have to get a certain beat going to get you worked up to a certain height so that we can make you feel something, so that you can believe something. All we need is the Word of God. The Word of God says that we've been given power in and through the Holy Spirit, but we can deny that power. We can embrace the form of a church, but we can deny the power. I'm asking you tonight, have you denied the power of the Holy Spirit in any area of your life? Or are you working at full capacity? Or are you operating at full capacity? I'm not, and I'm even so deceived, I don't even know what areas I have or am denying the power, but I'm before the Lord. And I'm saying, show me God. Shine the light of your word. Shine the light of your spirit. Expose anything in me. Expose everything about me. I have no shame. I have no. I want to be right with you, God. I want to operate in power. I was in the hospital room, uh, uh, ICU, just yesterday with Archie Mutz, and there he's laying. And, and, and I love what his uh, blessed his wife, Sister Cornelia, said. She said, Pastor, as you go in there, don't go by what you see. I, she said, you've taught us that we look at what the Word says, not what our eyes see. She said, and I'm standing on the Word. She said, but I'm just reminding you. And I said, I appreciate that. And I go in there, and, and I look beyond what I see in the natural, and I see what I see in the spiritual, and I start taking authority over every spirit of infirmity where Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He's trying to kill him. I'm, trying to, I'm coming against the devil, and I'm coming against the devil in the name of Jesus, and I'm coming against the devil with the Word of God, and I'm coming against the devil with 
the Spirit of God. And I walked out of there feeling, feeling great, be not because I saw anything change with my eyes, but I knew in the spirit realm we did some warring and we got some victory. And I'm expecting to hear great news coming from his recovery. Hallelujah. We're in a real war. We live in a highly charged spiritual environment. And somebody drops you off at some dead, dry, lifeless church on Sunday where there's not enough power there to be, give you any pushback against everything that's pushing against you, you're left hopeless. And when you feel hopeless, it opens the door for the spirit of fear. And Satan comes in with control over your life. We've got to understand that we are to be a power church on purpose. We're not waiting for power. We're not hoping for power. We have the power. We just got to stop denying it and release the power. We got to step out and we've got to, by faith, release the power. I'm taught, I, I tell you what, we're loud on purpose. We clap on purpose. We praise on purpose. We shout on purpose. We pray in tongues on purpose. We lay hands on the sick people and, and, and pray for them to recover on purpose. We come against demons with a vengeance on purpose. We walk the floor and we pray. We anoint our children with oil. We take handkerchiefs to the sick folks. Come on now. We stretch our hands over the north and the east and the south and the west and we call in the harvest of the Lord Jesus Christ and we call it in. Why? Because we know if we don't, it'll never happen. We're not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is a power. What a psychiatrist cannot do for you, the Holy Ghost can do for you. What a doctor can't do for you, the Holy Ghost can do for you. What an accountant can't do for you, the Holy Ghost can do for you. What a lawyer can't do for you, the Holy Ghost can do for you. What a banker can't do for you, the Holy Ghost can do for you. He can open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing on you in such measure that you cannot even contain it all. Hallelujah. When everyone says no, when everyone closes the door, when everyone gives you the red light or the stop sign, God is still saying, behold, I set before you an open door that no man can shut. Walk through that door with faith and release the power. See, we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could even ask or think. Why are we living on such a the skimp, the skimming of the surface of nothingness when we have a God who says he wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can even ask or think? But we deny the power. I'm here to remind you. I'm here to remind somebody that there's power. There's power. There's wonder-working Holy Ghost power provided from God, through God. I'm here to remind somebody there's demon casting out power. Why are you negotiating with a demon? Why are you making, uh, 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 making arrangements to, to put up with a demon? Why are you letting demons have any part of you? You've got Holy Ghost demon casting out power. You got sick body healing power. You got household salvation power. Don't you let your children or grandchildren go to hell. You got salvation, uh, 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 household salvation power. You got power to get out, power to win, power to push through, power to go to the next level. Stop living at the level you're at. Move to the next level. You got the power to do it through the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood under the power of the Holy Spirit preached one message and 3,000 were saved. Today, without the power, we preach 3,000 messages and maybe one gets saved. Power! We have the same power. Come on now. Acts was the church in seed form. People say, I want to go back to the book of Acts. I want to be like an Acts uh, 2 church. I want my, that was the baby. It's time for us to grow up. I hear the Spirit of the, of the Lord saying, it's time for the church to grow up. It's time for the church to grow up. And there may take a shaking of every nation on the earth to wake up the church that we need to grow up and step into the authority God has given us in the spiritual realm. So ask the Lord today, God, please show me anything, anything that is holding me back. Be honest. Be I have, and I am. I'm like... You show me anything that's holding me back, God. I'm going to deal with it. 
I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to deal with it suddenly because I want the power. I was created to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were created to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ by its very nature and the purpose and the plan that Jesus has established is to be a powerhouse. So we cannot deny the power. So there's power in his spirit. There's power in his blood. I said a trinity of power. There's power in his blood. Nothing else could redeem you. Nothing else could, could take the curse of sin off of you. But Jesus hanging on a tree, shedding his blood, took care of everything that needed to be taken care of to bring us up out of the vice of the enemy and set us upon a rock that is higher than anything we could have ever been established upon and to operate in power. There's power in his blood. 1 Peter 1 and 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold or your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your fathers. No, you were redeemed with what? The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You've been redeemed, church. You no longer have an excuse. You're no longer in bondage. You're no longer held as a hostage. Jesus has redeemed us. If you placed your faith in him, his blood has set you free. And he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You're free. Don't let the old stuff pull you down. Don't let the old memories pull you down. Don't let the history, and all history is ugly. All history is the working out and the recordings of sinful man uh, uh, doing everything they can to step on and take advantage of and get ahead of one another. Without God, the world uh, is a cesspool of evil and ugly. And history records that. But when the Son sets you free, you are now a new creation in Jesus Christ. You now have a future that's bright. You have a hope. You have everything given to you. The blood of Jesus has provided that. So you're no longer living under condemnation. You're no longer living under excuses. You're no longer living that this is why I can't and this is why I should. No! You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. There's no now neither Jew nor Gentile, no male nor female, no, no slave or free. There's none of that. We are children of God, a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, redeemed by the same blood. We are just as clean as the next one beside us. History has to go because history is just the recording of the most ugly, sinful acts of man and some recording of the good things that God has done through man. And whatever vantage point people look at, they can make it look any way they want. Let's go forward. If we're looking back, we're gonna wreck the car. The rearview mirror is just a glance, just a glance. Don't forget your history. You gotta you got glance at it, but don't drive looking at it. You gotta look, I'm redeemed. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb, I'm as sinless and clean as, as, as Jesus. Right? We are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he says that our righteousness is in him. However righteous he is, that's how righteous we are. And it wasn't by our good works. It was by him shedding his blood and redeeming us. That's why Revelation 12 and 11 says that they overcame the devil. They overcame Satan, the red dragon, by what? The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. I'm telling you, there's power in the blood. We've got the power of the Spirit. We have the power of the blood. And we also have the power of His name. Hallelujah. We have the power of His name. I'm telling you, you get in the Bible and you see that there are more names for Jesus, more titles than you'll find anywhere else. He's the last Adam, the author and the finish of our faith. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the Ancient of Days. He's the only begotten Son, the Beloved, the Bread of Life, the Bridegroom, the Bright and Morning Star. The Bible says He's the Everlasting Father, Jesus. He's Emmanuel. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the first fruit. He's the fountain of life. He's God. He's the great physician. He is our uh, present help in time of trouble. He's our healer. Hallelujah. Our husband, our horn of salvation, the head of the church. He's Hell's dread and heaven's wonder. The Bible says that he is the great I am. Hallelujah. He is the image of God's person, immortal, immortal, invisible, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's life and light, the lily of the valley, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is a living stone. He is love, the Bible says, the Lord of glory, the Messiah, the master, the only begotten of God. He is the priest, the Passover, the potent day, the prophet. He's the prince of peace, the shepherd of the sheep, the son of God, the servant, the seed 
seed of woman, the Savior. He's a sinless sacrifice, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says he's teacher. The Bible says he's truth. The Bible says he's tabernacle. He's tree of life. He's the word. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is the wisdom of God. He is wonderful. In the Bible, he is the fairest of ten thousands and altogether lovely and altogether wonderful. King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, he has so many names given. And there's none so precious as the majestic and the powerful name, the name Jesus, Yeshua. He is our Lord, our Savior, and our Messiah. And Matthew 1.20 says, you will call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will what? Save his people from their sin. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Use that word sozo, it's where we get our sozo ministry here from. That word saved, he will save his people. That sozo means healed, delivered, prospered, made whole, broken things, put back together and fixed. We thought it was just saved and go to heaven. But sozo covers all of that, Romans 10, 9, and 10, where you believe in your heart God has raised Jesus from the dead, confess with your mouth that, that Jesus is Lord, you shall be sozo, right there. Man, what an awesome promise of God. Salvation is his name. There is no other name under heaven given by which men shall be saved. You're not going to get saved under Buddha's name. You're not going to get saved under Muhammad's name. You're not going to get saved under Granddaddy's name. You can only get saved under the name of Jesus. Jesus. There's salvation in his name. There's forgiveness in his name. There's provision in his name. If you ask anything, he said, in my name, John 14 and 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Holy Ghost power in his name. But the helper, the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name. Hallelujah. There's Holy Ghost power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Mark 16, he says, all these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. You're going to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There's healing in his name. There's demon extraction in his name. And these signs shall follow them. In my name, they'll cast out demons. The name of Jesus triumphs all, triumphs all. And he's given us his name. He's given us his blood. He's given us his spirit. We see all power is in his spirit. All power is in his name. All power, the Bible says, is in his blood. We have everything that gives us all power. We must understand that, embrace that, rise up under that anointing and begin to move into the world and let the power of God be manifest in and through us. We have a name, a name, the name of Jesus. Paul tried to make it so dramatic with this Greek uh, literature style called a chiasmus. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, those, those verses there, he uses this uh, 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 literary structure. We understand that, let's say a hymn, a hymnal, we understand that structure. We sing a verse, we sing a chorus, we sing another verse, we sing a chorus. We know the structure. We bounce between those. Well, this chiasmus was not a hymn bouncing between chorus and verses uh, entered in there. It's a picture of stairs going down. That something's going to start at a high place and it's going to come down to the very lowest place. But then something's going to happen amazing at that lowest place that's going to turn everything around. So it starts climbing back up to the highest place. It's called a chiasmus. And Paul uses that in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. He says to us, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made him of himself no reputation. So he's laying down his glory. He's going to come to this earth as man, dependent on the Holy Spirit, so that he could be the true sacrifice for us. If he came here as God, operating in his glory, then he could not have been the sacrifice that walked among us, that was tempted in sin and said no to sin by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like you and I do, then he would have been disqualified. So he's laying down his robes, his, his glory, and his reputation. And he came, the Bible says, as a man, taking on not just any man, but the man that is a slave. So he didn't come to rule over everybody. He came to serve. That's why he's washing feet when nobody else would wash feet. He's come to serve. So he's a slave, but he's not just a, a regular slave. He's a slave that is very obedient. 
to his master. And not just the obedient, even obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So it takes you down to, the, in that day and time, the worst death known to mankind would be Roman crucifixion. There's nothing could be worse, nothing more humiliating, nothing more shameful, nothing that says to the world that you are the worst of the worst of the worst of humanity. The most pain, the most lingering pain, the most uh, known pain that you could go through. And here he came, and that chiasmus, even this is God. And he lays it down and comes obedient even to death of the cross. Now, why would he do that? You can just sit there and scratch your head and say, why would Jesus come all the way and suffer all of this? And then you just keep hearing, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. We're right here at the bottom of the bottom. We're perishing. We're the center of sinners. We're perishing. We're lost. We're blind. We have no hope. We have no way out. If he didn't come to us, we couldn't have come to him. So he comes to us. And when he comes to us, you might would say in this cesspool of, of, of brokenness. And there we are drowning with our hands reaching up. We need a Savior. And he takes hold of us. And then the Bible says, therefore, God has exalted him. And now you see him coming up on the other side of the chiasmus and giving him what? A name. A name. Giving him what? A name. There's power in this name. That at this name, every knee has to bow in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. And every tongue has to confess his lordship. This name is going to rule. This name is going to win. This name is going to be in charge in the very end of the end. In the final battle of battles, you're going to see this name triumphant. This name he's been given. And he's highly exalted him and given him this name. And every knee is bowing. Every tongue is confessing confessing that Jesus, Yeshua, is Lord. And he says, I give you my name and the authority it brings. In my name, you can cast out devils. In my name, you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. In my name, you can part the pathway of darkness and demonic activity with the light of my word. The red dragon is defeated in my name. In my name. But you got to testify to it. You got to testify to it. His name has no power unless it's coming off of your lips. We overcame the red dragon by the blood of the lamb that he has given to us. That lamb has a name. He has a name. And we got to testify to what he has done with his blood, provided with his blood. And we got to remind the devil who's really in charge. And it's Yeshua. Is Jesus. He is Lord. He is exalted above all. Hallelujah. And now he's at the right hand of the Father. And his name is above all names. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And all of his enemies are under his feet. And he says that his government and peace will never end. But until he comes back in the second coming, and until he comes and raptures us and prepares then to come back that second coming, he said, I've got this, this time that I'm going, to build the, I'm going to build something called the church. From these four feasts of the spring feasts coming into these three fall feasts, I'm going to, in that time frame, I'm going to have a church age. And I'm going to show the devil and I'm going to show the enemies of God what my people can do with my spirit, with my blood, and with my name. They're going to triumph. And millions of billions are going to be born into the kingdom of God. And sons of God are going to be multiplied from the day of Pentecost and added to the church daily even to, unto this day. We cannot just sit back and say we're spectators of this. God has called each and, of, each and every one of us to be participators. His power needs an outlet to flow in and through. And that outlet is you. Is you. The resource is available. He's the resource. He just needs a willing body who will say, God, I know my purpose on this earth is to be about advancing your kingdom, expanding your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And I don't want to be found guilty another day having a form of godliness. 
but denying the power. And as long as I don't go and confront the evils of this world, I don't need your power. I can hide in my closet. I can hide in, in my light under a bushel. I can hide it. But you said my light was not to be hidden under a bushel, but it was to shine. You had Joshua break the clay pots that was hiding the, the, the torches, the light that they had. And 300 men were able to defeat an innumerable army. You were giving us pictures of what your spirit would do, what your, your blood would do. You were showing us what your light of your word would do, what faith could do. And they, did, they didn't even have what we have in the new covenant. So let us break the clay pot, us, and say, God, I want your light to shine. I don't know how many days or years I have left, but I want every one of them to count for shining, illuminating, driving out darkness. There's a lot of darkness trying to cover the earth. But let me tell you what, darkness never argues with light. I've never heard darkness squeal. I've never heard darkness give a three-point debate. Never heard it. Light turns on, darkness is just gone. That's how powerful light is. And you have the light of his word in you, the light of his spirit in you, and he's calling you to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Are we going to shine or not? I'm telling you, I can't make you. I found people that I plead with and I bargain with and I make a deal with that, that they'll start shining. It doesn't last. You got to do it for Jesus. I didn't die for you, he did. I didn't give my life for you, he did. I didn't prepare eternity for you, he did. So if you're going to do it, do it for him. Let the light of his love and the light of his power shine. Let love be seen one with another. But let power be demonstrated against every principality and power and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Let the church wake up. Let the church arise. Let the church own. Come on, let us own our power. The power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father God, I just ask by the power of your Holy Spirit an anointing on this closing prayer. I want to thank you, Father, for being here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for ministering my fumbling, failing words, how you've been able to take them and speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. So I pray, Spirit of the living God, fall on this place now. Spirit of the living God, touch every heart, touch every fiber of every being here, I pray. Rise in every heart. Break every yoke, I pray, Spirit of the living God. Loose every chain. Give us an ear to hear and a mind to receive, Lord God, and believe your word. Shake this place with your power. God, I pray you would shake me with your power. That you would shake me loose of anything of this world that is holding me back. That you would shake any chains off. Uh, and Lord God, that you would shake a praise up out of a dead heart in this place. Turn somebody's life around. Let somebody see from how far they have been redeemed and for how much they owe you, Lord God, uh, that with appreciation and gratitude uh, and a heart to serve, that we rise up uh, and be who you've called us to be. Be who you've redeemed us to be. In this place right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, you to begin to do a miracle, work miracles in and through us. Lord God, that we would go forth from this place on purpose, and Lord God, we would be the light you've called us to do. We would break the clay pot. We would not hide under a bushel, but we would go forth to shine forth for your glory and for your honor. And if you're ready and willing, and you're, that's your heart and desire, God, here am I. I don't want a form of godliness. I don't want to deny the power. I want your power. 
I want the power of your spirit. I want the power of your blood. I want the power of your name. I want the power of your word. I want the power of your anointing, Lord God. I want your power. I want to operate in your power. I want to bring glory and honor to you. I want to bring advancement to your kingdom. If that's your declaration, God, I want this in my life. Come on, put your hands together and say, I'm ready. And I'm willing, oh Lord. Send me. Send me now, Lord God. Just ask him now. God, send me back into my home. Send me back to the workplace. Send me, Lord God, into the marketplace. Send me, Lord God, into my neighborhood. I want to go and be a light shining for you. And I want to go be the demonstration of your power and your love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I pray you will go with that declaration even now as we go in the name of Jesus.